Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I hope you've all had a great week. If you are new here, please consider subscribing if you end up liking this video. So today we're talking about a woman named Victoria Nasarova. And Victoria is an absolutely bizarre, downright horrible person who is motivated by one thing and one thing only, and that is money. A fugitive accused of luring men and poisoning women to steal their jewelry, cash, and even identity. Victoria Nasriova adds attempted murder to her already long list of charges. You might recognize Victoria because she has been seen in the news recently, because even though her crimes took place back in 2014, 2016, um, she was actually only just sentenced in April of this year, 2023. Victoria is originally from Russia, but she moved to the United States back in 2015 in order to escape some very serious charges. And most of the coverage of this case on YouTube, at least, has been from news channels like ABC, CBS, and most of their coverage is about the doppelganger and the cheesecake. And if you are familiar with this case, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you have no clue what I'm talking about, then just get ready to listen to a pretty wild story. So yeah, let's just go ahead and jump in. But first, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef is a certified organic company that offers balanced and delicious meals shipped right to your door. You know those nights when you just can't figure out what you're gonna cook and it's just getting later and later into the evening and your kids are just repeatedly asking you what's for dinner and you eventually just run out of time so you end up just eating whatever you have lying around. My personal go-to is cereal typically on those nights. Well, my family has a term for this. We call it catch a can, which literally means just catch what you can like whatever you can find to eat, a sandwich, chicken nuggets, cereal. Green Chef has definitely helped to cut down on catch a can nights for my family because I don't have to do any of the grocery shopping or spend time trying to figure out what I'm going to make, which is probably the hardest part for me. The food is quick and easy to prepare, typically only taking about 30 minutes. The meal that I made last night was the creamy paprika shrimp with green beans and cabbage slaw, and it was absolutely delicious and super simple to cook. Only took me about 20 minutes from start to finish. Each kit contains a variety of organic ingredients that are sent bagged up together and already measured out. So all I had to do was some light chopping and mixing and everything was ready for me to cook. And the best part is the food actually tastes really good. They have options for every lifestyle, whether it's keto, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, Mediterranean, or maybe you just want some fast and fit meals. Green Chef has you covered. And you can also customize your orders every week to satisfy the entire family. You can even mix and match different dietary preferences if you want. Green Chef really is the number one best meal kit for eating well. And now you can use my code SUMMER60 to get 60% off plus free shipping on your first box. Go to greenchef.com for more details. Thanks again to Green Chef for sponsoring this video and now let's jump into the case. On October 5th, 2014, a woman named Nadia Ford was frantically calling her mother, 54-year-old Ala Alasinko, with no luck. Nadia had moved to Brooklyn, New York from her hometown of Krasnodar, Russia in 2007 for college, but her mother Ala had remained in Krasnodar living there alone in her little apartment. Krasnodar is located very close to the Black Sea and it's about 800 miles from Moscow. Despite now living across the world from one another, Nadia and Ala remained extremely close and they spoke on the phone every day without fail. So when Nadia couldn't get a hold of her mother on October 5th, 2014, she immediately knew that something just wasn't right. And she already had a pretty good idea of what could have possibly happened to her. Ala had a next door neighbor, a woman in her late 30s who had recently befriended her. And Ala, being a very sweet, friendly, trusting person, welcomed this neighbor into her life with open arms. Her new friend's name was Victoria Nasirova. And unknown to Ala or Nadia, Victoria was a very dangerous woman. And over time, Victoria and Ala became best friends. They were together pretty much all the time. Not long before Victoria and Ala became friends, Ala had come into a large amount of money. She had recently sold a home that had belonged to her late parents, and she got what equates to about $51,000 from the sale of the home. In addition to that, Ala had a little nest egg of her own that she had built up over the years and she kept all of this money hidden in her apartment. One day, Ala called Nadia to tell her that Victoria was planning a trip to New York soon and she would be delivering some valuables to her. She was supposed to bring Nadia two mink fur coats and $6,000 in cash. So Ala gives Victoria all of these valuable possessions under the assumption that she will be leaving very soon for New York to deliver these things to her daughter. But the days go by and Victoria still hasn't left. And 
And as time passes and Victoria still has not left for this trip, Alla starts to suspect that Victoria has no intentions of actually going to New York. So Alla calls Nadia to tell her what's going on and that she's starting to get a little worried that Victoria is not going on this New York trip. And if that's the case, then Alla wants her valuables back. On October 4th, Alla calls Nadia to tell her that she spoke to Victoria about everything and she had agreed to come by to return the money and the two mink coats. But by the next day, when Nadia called her mom for their daily chat, she didn't answer. This was totally out of the norm for Alla. In the last eight years that Nadia had been living in New York, her mother had always answered the phone when she called. So Nadia spent pretty much that entire day just repeatedly calling her mother with no luck. She actually estimates that she called at least 100 times. And when the day passed with no answer and no call back, Nadia knew something was seriously wrong. So she decides to reach out to Victoria. She knew that she and her mom had plans to meet up. And so she knew that she could possibly be the last person to have seen her. And when Nadia called Victoria, she actually did pick up. And Nadia just asks, where's my mom? Victoria tells her that she had went over to Alla's the day before and they had had tea together and then she had returned home. Then she said after that, Alla left to go on a trip with some friends and that her phone had probably just died while she was away. And by the end of that conversation, Nadia was even more worried about Alla and she didn't believe anything Victoria had told her. So the next day while Nadia is at work, she decided to do some digging. She got online to look at her mother's cell phone call log to see if she could find anything that stood out. And that's when she sees that the last person that her mother spoke to before she went dark was Victoria Nasirova. In Nadia's mind, this was proof that Victoria knew much more than she was letting on. So she dropped everything, she packed a bag, and she headed straight for the airport and boarded a plane to Russia. Once she landed, she called the Russian police to report that her mother was missing and to tip them off that Victoria might have something to do with it. So while police are on their way, Nadia calls Victoria and tells her to come outside and meet her in front of the apartment building. And as soon as Victoria walked out of the building, Nadia grabs her and she demands to know where her mother is. Victoria just started screaming that Allah is alive and she just denied having anything to do with her disappearance. Then she manages to get away from Nadia and she just runs back into the building, up the stairs and into her apartment where she locks herself inside. Police show up and they go in and they question Victoria about Allah's disappearance, which at this point, Allah had been missing for three days. No word from her and no activity on her cell phone. But Victoria was able to charm her way out of it. And after questioning her for a while, the police left with no answers. So Nadia goes into Allah's apartment and she starts kind of snooping around and she realizes that someone has taken pretty much everything of value from that apartment, money, jewelry, family heirlooms, everything. As I mentioned earlier, Allah had come into some money recently from the sale of her parents' home and she kept all of this money hidden under a dresser behind some wooden boards. So to access this money, you would have to get down on the floor and pull these slats of wood from the bottom of this dresser. So you would have to know where to look. It was not an obvious hiding place. Only the people closest to Allah would have known about this, her children, and apparently her best friend, Victoria Nasirova. Because when Nadia pulled back those wooden slats, she discovered that all of the money was gone. She also noticed that the apartment seemed to have been scrubbed completely clean. Alla had a stainless steel refrigerator, and I'm sure you know that, you know, whenever you touch those, you leave fingerprints. I mean, they're really hard to keep clean. There were absolutely no prints anywhere on this refrigerator. The entire apartment looked like it had been scrubbed down. Nadia would end up spending spending six months in Russia in an attempt to find out what happened to her mother. She took a leave from her job back in New York and she was not giving up until she had answers. Nadia was constantly going down to the police station and just begging for answers, pushing them to help more with the case. And she eventually became known to the police as the crazy American daughter. Nothing seemed to be moving in her mother's case, no matter how hard she pushed. So Nadia started her own investigation. She started thinking, what if Victoria drove Alla out of Krasnodar. Maybe one of the traffic cameras picked something up. According to Nadia, if you have money in Russia, you can buy pretty much anything. And so she manages to get her hands on some of the footage from the traffic cameras that lead out of the city. And that's when she finds something truly shocking. She sees images of a woman driving a car and in the passenger seat, there appears to be another woman 
slumped over, seemingly unconscious or no longer alive. Even though these images are pretty blurry, Nadia knows that the woman in the passenger seat is her mother. And to top it all off, the date on that footage was October 5th, 2014, the exact day that Allah went missing. Nadia immediately goes to the police to show them what she's found, but to her surprise, the police said they already had that footage in their possession. And they had also found out that the license plate of the car in the footage belonged to a rental car taken out in Victoria's name. They had been doing an investigation into Victoria all along. They end up bringing Victoria in for some more questioning and to take a lie detector test. And during the test, they ask her questions specifically about the rental car, if she was alone when she was driving it. They also ask her general questions about Ala and her disappearance. And then after the test was over, the investigators made the mistake of letting Victoria leave the station while they processed the results. And as soon as she walked out of that station, she went on the run. She got a fake passport and headed to Moscow. And then from there, she flew to Mexico. Victoria was now officially an international fugitive. A red notice was issued and she was also added to the Interpol list wanted for murder. Interpol is the International Criminal Police Organization. It allows authorities from different areas all over the world to share information about international fugitives. Victoria felled every single question that she took on the polygraph, by the way. Not that those tests are really reliable, but in this case, it was, allegedly. And as if finding out that Victoria has escaped wasn't bad enough, Nadia finds out that one of the officers who was supposedly working the case had started having an affair with Victoria, and he was deliberately stalling any progress in the case in order to protect her. We haven't really touched on this, but Victoria has a way of charming men. She definitely knows how to use her sexuality to her advantage. She's also been described as voluptuous and sexy. So yeah, apparently a lot of men found her pretty irresistible and she knew how to manipulate them into doing whatever she wanted. So Nadia remained in Krasnodar, still searching for any sign of Allah. But then in April of 2015, so six months after she first arrived, she got the news that she had been dreading. About a three hour drive outside of Krasnodar in a wooded area, human remains were discovered and believed to be that of Allah. The remains were pretty much just charred bones and it was obvious that someone had burned the body in an attempt to destroy it. Nadia went down to identify the remains and she was only able to do so by looking at the teeth. That was pretty much the only recognizable trait. And it turns out that Allah's body had been found not even one mile outside of the city of Armavir, which is the city where Victoria Nasirova grew up. And now that Allah had been found, Nadia did return home to Brooklyn with a huge hole in her heart. And after weeks of serious mourning and not leaving her home, Nadia decided to log into Facebook. And just out of curiosity, she typed the name Victoria Nasirova into the search bar. And there she was right there on the screen, posting selfie after selfie, seemingly living a glamorous life, traveling, wearing furs and diamonds, giving off the air of a celebrity or an influencer. She was also checking into all of these different places on Facebook. You know, the check-in feature on Facebook where you can, you know, check in at different locations like Starbucks or something. And it'll say like Summer Sanchez is at Starbucks in Manhattan, New York. Yeah, she was doing that. And most of her check-ins were clustered within a specific area of New York. So now Nadia realizes that Victoria is likely now living in New York where she lives. So she contacts immigration officers to let them know that Victoria is on the Interpol list and she's likely living in New York. And they do look into this, but they have no luck tracking her down. So then she hires a private investigator named Herman Weisberg. And this decision turned the entire case around. Herman had been a New York police officer for over 20 years. And after he retired, he started his own PI firm. And let me just tell you the way he found Victoria, who was literally in a city of millions and millions of people people is just crazy. So Herman begins his investigation by scrolling through all of Victoria's Facebook posts, and he finds one selfie in particular that catches his attention. In this selfie, Victoria is sitting in a car and she is wearing mirrored sunglasses. So you can clearly see everything that's being reflected in them. Herman can make out the dashboard layout in the car, which looks pretty unique. But what really catches his attention is the gray stitching on the black leather seats with the dashboard layout and the gray stitching 
literally his only leads at this point, Herman takes a trip to the parking lot of a train station. This parking lot is huge and there are always hundreds and hundreds of cars parked there at any given time. So he figured he'd take a little look around and see if he can find any of these features in any of the cars that are sitting in the lot. And somehow he manages to find a car that has both the stitching and the same dashboard layout as the one in the selfie. The car turned out to be a Chrysler 300. Now this was not the exact car that Victoria was sitting in, in that selfie of course, but he at least now knows the make and model. So like I said, Victoria was checking into all these different locations around New York. Well, Herman noticed that most of her Facebook check-ins were scattered around Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. Sheepshead Bay is a neighborhood in Brooklyn with a high population of Russian American residents. So Herman figures they should probably start their search there. He and some of his team go driving all around the neighborhood and they take down the license plate numbers of every single Chrysler 300 that they see and they start running plates. And they end up finding one of the Chryslers was registered to a man with a Russian sounding name. So Herman gets the address for the apartment building that belongs to this person and he heads over and that's when he notices something familiar. He notices in yet another Facebook selfie where again, Victoria is wearing mirrored sunglasses. The reflection shows the outside of an apartment building with a telephone pole and two manhole covers right next to each other. The address that was associated with that Chrysler had a telephone pole and two manhole covers right in front of it exactly like the image in Victoria's sunglasses. So Herman assumes that Victoria is likely in a relationship with the owner of the Chrysler and potentially living with him in that apartment. And he was 100% right. Victoria was living in that apartment, which was only a few blocks away from Nadia's home. The entire time that Nadia had been searching for her mother's killer, she had been living in the same neighborhood. They had probably even crossed paths at some point. And it didn't take Herman long to realize that once Victoria had fled Russia, she landed in New York and started wreaking havoc there. Her life of crime did not stop. So most of Victoria Nasarova's life leading up to her crimes is a bit of a mystery. We know she was born on December 15th, 1975 in the city of Armavir in Russia. And of course we know that she fled to the United States after killing Allah, allegedly, and then she made her way to New York. So when Victoria arrived in New York, she began working as an escort where she advertised herself as a dominatrix. This is a person who takes on the dominant role in BDSM activities. BDSM is an acronym for bondage and discipline, dominance and submission and sadism and masochism. Some of the activities involve bondage, role playing, causing physical pain and humiliation. And Victoria was admittedly really into the pain and humiliation part of her job. She herself has said that she got into that line of work as a dominatrix because she hated men and she wanted to humiliate them. And during these sessions, she would often assume the role as the man and the man would pretend to be the woman and she would humiliate them and torment them as much as they were willing to take. A lot of her clients were married or they were in very notable positions in society, according to Victoria. And she said that they came to her because they weren't able to get what they really wanted from from their partners. BDSM is actually pretty common, I think, and people should be able to express themselves in the bedroom however they want to, as long as their partner or partners are totally willing and consenting, which was the case for Victoria's clients. They were literally paying her for these services. However, Victoria started doing some things that her clients did not consent to and were absolutely not okay with. On at least a few occasions, Victoria slipped something into either the food or drinks of her clients, fed it to them without their knowledge and then stole thousands of dollars in money and valuables from them while they were unconscious. And this was not a situation where the victim was, you know, just in a heavy sleep for a few hours. No, these men were near death. Investigators believe that the majority of Victoria's victims wouldn't want to come forward about this, likely out of embarrassment, or maybe they were worried that their spouses would find out. And that's why it's thought that Victoria has many more victims out there. So in addition to advertising herself on the escort site, Victoria also had a profile on a Russian dating website. 
and she would make connections with various men around New York. And one day she catches the eye of a man named Ruben. Ruben runs a dry cleaning service in New York and he was single and looking for companionship. And when he sees Victoria's profile, he decides to connect with her and the two begin texting back and forth. Victoria mentions that she is a really good cook, which was a huge bonus for Ruben. So he's talking to this beautiful Russian woman, plus she's a great cook, so he thinks he's hit the jackpot. Eventually, Victoria invites Ruben to come over to her apartment and have dinner with her. She says she's going to cook for him. And Ruben happily agrees. He would later say that he did assume that they would also be hooking up that night. So he was pretty excited about this date. So as soon as he arrives at Victoria's place, she immediately starts insisting that Ruben eat the dinner that she prepared for him, which was fish and vegetables. She was very pushy about it. So Ruben sits down to eat this meal that she had made for him and he takes one bite of fish and immediately loses consciousness. Victoria had obviously laced the fish with something and once Ruben was out, Victoria left him there and went on a shopping spree with his money. She took $600 in cash that he had and she also took his American Express card and spent $2,400. By the next day, Ruben was still in and out of consciousness, but Victoria needed him out of the apartment. So she loads him up and she takes him down to his dry cleaning business and she helps him walk inside and proceeds to tell his worker which included his sister, that he had drank multiple bottles of wine and she thought he might have taken pills as well. And that's why he was so out of it. One of the employees started filming. So there is actual footage of Victoria saying all of this. Meanwhile, Ruben can't defend himself or tell anyone that it's not true because he's still totally out of it. There is also footage of Ruben being carried out of his dry cleaning business on a stretcher because they finally had to call 911 to get him some help. But by the time the ambulance arrived, Victoria had vanished, but not before stealing some money from a cash register that she found down in the basement and also Ruben's watch. Ruben was in the hospital for about a week recovering from whatever Victoria had done to him and he was close to death, but thankfully he did survive. And not long after this, Victoria struck again, but this time her motive was much, much more sinister than just monetary gain. Olga Svik was a Ukrainian immigrant living in New York. She had come to the US in 2014 under political asylum during the Crimean crisis. She had a friend already living in New York named Marina who helped her get settled and to find a place to stay. And Olga ended up moving in with Marina's uncle who was living alone in a two-story home in Queens County. The two were not in a relationship or anything. Olga just lived in the home. She actually had her own space upstairs. And over the course of the next couple of years, Olga applied for and was granted something called an employment authorization. This meant that she was legally able to work in America and she was also issued an employment authorization card so that she could prove her status anytime she needed to. The card had a photo of Olga on it along with her address and other pieces of personal information. And by 2016, Olga had found her calling in the beauty industry working as an eyelash specialist and she set up a station in a salon in the Forest Hills area of Queens doing lash extensions. And one of Olga's clients was none other than Victoria Nasarova. Victoria had always struck Olga as a little pushy. She was sort of a demanding client, but Olga was always kind to her. And when Victoria would come in for her services, she would talk to her about this and that. But there was one thing that Olga couldn't help but notice. There was a very obvious resemblance between herself and Victoria. They looked a lot alike. They had the same skin tone, the same dark hair. They were also close in age and they had similar accents. And another thing Olga found strange was that Victoria was traveling all the way from Brooklyn to Queens to have her eyelashes done regularly. Getting from one point to another in New York isn't always an easy task. And Olga felt like going from Brooklyn to Queens is quite the journey to make for eyelashes when there were lots of other technicians in Brooklyn. Victoria was also constantly asking Olga to hang out outside of the salon. She was trying really hard to be her friend. But Olga really didn't have any interest in pursuing anything other than a professional relationship with Victoria. So she was constantly turning her down. So one day while Victoria was having her lashes done, she tells Olga that she was happy because she was getting ready to get her green card soon. And this conversation led Olga to tell Victoria that she had been issued her employment authorization card. And you've probably already worked this out, but Victoria was not getting ready to get her green card. She just said that to get Olga to open up about her status so that she could 
kill her and then steal her identity. She had likely seen Olga's services advertised and saw a photo of her, realized they looked a lot alike, and that's probably why she started going to Olga's salon for her services. She wanted to befriend her and earn her trust and manipulate her the same way she had Allah back in Russia. But the problem was Olga didn't want to be her friend, so she had to come up with another plan to get her alone. So Victoria goes to the salon in August for her usual appointment. But then later that week on August 28th, 2016, she calls Olga in a panic. She says that she's getting ready to go out of town and she needed an emergency eyelash repair and she asked if she could come to Olga's home for her to do this. This was the weekend and Olga was not working. She was at home. Olga feels super uncomfortable about this and she asked her to meet her at the salon instead but Victoria just kept insisting that she needed it done right then and it would be faster if she just went to Olga's house. After a lot of pressure Olga finally relents and she says okay you can just come here and I'll fix it. So Victoria arrives at Olga's home and she goes upstairs to her room and Olga fixes the eyelashes. And to repay Olga for helping her out last minute, Victoria pulls out a clear plastic to-go container that has three small slices of cheesecake in it. Victoria tells Olga, you have to try this cheesecake. It's from this famous bakery. It's the best cheesecake in New York. Then Victoria takes two of the small slices for herself and she eats them. And then she insists that Olga eats her her slice right then. So Olga starts eating the cheesecake and she's instantly hit with severe nausea and dizziness and then she loses consciousness. Victoria had laced the cheesecake with a deadly dose of a drug called phenazepam. Phenazepam is a benzodiazepine that suppresses the central nervous system. It's typically used for people with anxiety and for people who have epilepsy. It's produced in Russia and it's not even legal in the United States. So once Olga was out and presumably dying, Victoria went through her things and took anything of value, including some money Olga had saved up. And most importantly, she took her passport and employment authorization card. Victoria knew the authorities were on her trail in Allah's murder case, and she desperately needed to become someone else. And she thought she found the perfect person in Olga. They had a lot of physical similarities. And best of all, Olga was in the United States legally and had all of the documentation to prove it. Olga remembers waking up at one point hours later to Victoria bringing her chicken soup. She says that she doesn't remember, but she thinks that she must have eaten some of the soup because she lost consciousness again right after that. So of course it is thought that the soup was also poisoned. Then once Victoria thought that she had finally given Olga enough phenazepam to kill her, she changed her out of her sweats and into some sexy lingerie. Then she threw phenazepam all around the room to make it look like Olga had taken her own life. Then just for good measure before she left, she turned the heat up up full blast even though it was August and already very hot outside. It was later discovered that the effects of phenazepam on the human body are worsened if the person is exposed to extreme heat. And so Olga was just left in her room to die. Then two days later, her friend came by and discovered that she was nearly lifeless on the bed and rushed her to the hospital. The doctors did tell Olga that if she wouldn't have been found when she was, she probably would not have made it. Olga is alive, but she's still in and out of consciousness. At one point she did slip into a coma. She's also hallucinating. She's still extremely ill. The doctors don't know what's wrong with her and she can't remember much at this point. So. They're just doing all kind of tests, but everything was negative. After several days in two different hospitals, Olga was finally discharged, but with no solid answers as to what had happened to her. Her sister Irina, who was still living in Ukraine at the time, had been notified that Olga had been in the hospital very sick with an unknown illness, and so she had flown to New York to take care of her sister. And when Irina entered Olga's bedroom and started looking around, she discovered that Olga's documents, including her employment authorization card, Card were all gone. And then Arena finds about 30 white pills scattered on the ground near the bed. And at this point, Olga is starting to get little glimpses of her memory back. And the last person she remembers being in her room was Victoria Nasirova. They know that there is something really sketchy going on and Victoria is responsible. They gather up the pills and they call the police. So police arrive and they tell them all about the cheesecake, the pills, the fact that Olga had just been released from the hospital from a mysterious illness. And they tell them that Victoria was the person responsible. And as police start looking around, they actually found the empty cheesecake container in the trash can. I honestly don't know how Victoria remained free for so long because she seems to make a lot of mistakes. 
the cheesecake container was tested and it was discovered that finazepam was present. The theory was put forth that Victoria had tried to kill Olga by staging a deliberate overdose and then she planned to become Olga's fic. So while police are trying to track Victoria down to question her, Herman, the private investigator that Nadia had hired months ago, is finally closing in on Victoria's exact location. And in March of 2017, Victoria was finally arrested in front of her apartment building. And once she was arrested, the police did also question her boyfriend, the man who owned the Chrysler 300. And he told police that he was actually one of Victoria's victims as well. She had stolen valuables and money from him, but much, much worse than that, he said that Victoria killed his beagle. He claims that Victoria was really jealous of this dog, so she killed him on his birthday. I don't know the details and I don't want to know the details, but this just shows you what an absolutely evil person Victoria is. She cares about literally no one but herself. Olga's documents were found in Victoria's apartment and her DNA was also found on the cheesecake container as well. Victoria pretty much denied everything and she remained in prison at Rikers Island awaiting trial for a while due to delays from the pandemic. He's discovered an international warrant for her arrest for the 2014 murder of a woman in Russia. My mom in the grave and she just enjoying her life. In an interview with 48 Hours from jail, Nasriova denied trying to poison her friend. I know whom you mean. I know this young woman. I can tell you that. Um, I did not force her to eat it. Indicted Tuesday, the Queen's District Attorney says Nasriova served her friend a poison cheesecake in Forest Hills back in 2016. And before passing out, the woman's last memory is of seeing the defendant sitting beside her inside her home. After this uh, part, I don't remember nothing. The case finally went to trial in January of 2023. And even though this trial didn't have anything to do with Victoria's crimes from back in Russia with Allah, Nadia was still sitting in that courtroom every day. Lots of different witnesses were called, including Olga, of course. And when she got on the stand to tell her story, Victoria just stared at her and smiled. She was just so cocky through the whole thing. Like she really believed that somehow she would be found not guilty, but she was found guilty of attempted murder, assault, and larceny. And she was sentenced to 21 years in prison. She did get a few years taken off for time served. So it's thought that she'll spend about 15 years in prison, but this is totally separate from the murder charges that she still wants wanted for in Russia. There isn't an extradition agreement in place between the United States and Russia. So what will likely happen is Victoria will serve her 15 years here in America. And then once she's released, she will be deported where she will likely be tried for murder in a Russian court. And the time that she's been serving at Rikers Island has been pretty rough for Victoria. She was actually severely assaulted by some of the inmates. Victoria ended up bringing a lawsuit against the city of New York for negligence. And in the end, she was awarded $325,000. I definitely expect to hear more about this case in the coming years. Everyone keeps referring to it as a made for TV crime. So I'm assuming there are going to be books, probably movies made, documentaries. So it'll be interesting interesting to see what comes of that. But let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Thanks again to Green Chef for sponsoring this video and you can find the link to that down in the description box. If you found this video interesting, please consider subscribing to my channel and following me on Instagram at summer underscore Sanchez YT. And as always, I appreciate each and every one of you for watching and I will see you next time.